it's really an honor to be here and thank you all for joining us in uh, elevating the, the uh, this ceremony. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a place of recreation now, but back in the day it was uh, not a happy place, as you can imagine. Uh, the soldiers who came here were often in very bad shape and just getting themselves ready to go back into civilian life uh, with the help of, of the army and the army uh, doctors up here. Um, so let me just give you an idea of where you're standing right now and where the camp had been. It was set up in quickly in the early part of 1864. Um, it was approximately a quarter mile square. There was a, it went down here somewhere right along the edge of the houses, the present houses, across the back uh, where we're parked, uh, probably a little bit behind there, over about a quarter mile, straight down again, about a quarter mile, all the way down to the riverfront where there was also a railroad stop, the Reading Railroad ran there, and that was essential to the camp's operation. Um, up the top here was where the officer, the headquarters and the officer's quarters were. Uh, there were a couple of stables right up here and over there, and some uh, supply buildings as well. Right here would have been the parade ground, very large parade ground that went one end to the other. Um, there was a hospital building right around here and another hospital building facing it of maybe 200 yards or so across on the other side of the parade ground. There was a three sides of this then were barracks. There were 10 barracks buildings each designed to hold 200 men at you know maximum capacity. They went down the side and across and up again and interspersed were latrines um, which also uh, doubled as deposit, you know, places to uh, for refuse, and that's where Brad has done some of his uh, best digging and excavating. <laughs> honest to God, he did. He has uh, because of the double purpose of it, and he's found many artifacts. They're they're great. Um, so that's an idea of the of the camp itself. It served men from six. No, excuse me, eighty nine Pennsylvania regiments. As I say, it was set up in 1864. For those of you who know, remember your Civil War history, the war started in, in early in 61. And uh, the men who were served here uh, were at the end of their three year term of duty, again, 1864. The war was not over. We didn't know when the war was gonna end at that point, but their term of duty was up. They had signed up for three year terms. They were called three year men. Um, they had fought in many of the greatest battles of the war, uh, and they, most of them wanted out, wanted to go back, their families wanted them back. Um, so a lot of their regiments were being discharged in an orderly way, and the men were going back, back home. The men who came became discharged were a subset of their regiments. They were men who had been cut off from their regiments. They had been separated from their regiments through one circumstance or other of war. Uh, some of had been wounded or very ill, and they had spent time in southern in, um, hospital, Union hospitals in the south, where Union had captured territory, they would set up hospitals. Uh, others had been captured by the Confederates and spent time in prison camps. So their regular regiments were off here. They were stuck back there. By the time they were able to move, they didn't know where their regiments were. They might have been 200 miles away from them. Uh, so the war is winding down. They're getting, some of them are getting out of, out of prison because of prisoner exchanges. We're staggering their way north. Um, or they were well enough to get out of hospitals and again were coming up here. They would be sent to the adjutant's office down in Center City, Philly to identify themselves. Uh, they would get a pass then to take the Reading Railroad line down. There was a stop bottom of the hill here and they would make their way up, up the trail. If they were in bad shape, there was a, a hospital wagon that would pick them up, an ambulance, and bring them up here. They would report to the headquarters up here. 
identify themselves, be entered in the ledger, uh, and they would be assigned to a barracks <clears throat> and go and kill time in the barracks. Um, meanwhile, the adjutant would send a courier out and find where the, their paperwork was with their regiment uh, and reconcile that. We heard from, you know, uh, Private uh, Jones uh, from the 36th Company A. He says he was captured May of 64 at the Wilderness. Uh, do you have a record of him and did you lose track of him at that point? They would get here back. Yes, that's true. We did have him. We didn't know what happened. He's not in our records from that point forward. So they would figure he that's him. Uh, he was owed X amount of pay, uh, maybe a bounty or a bonus, depending. Um, and so that word would get back to the adjutant and they would then figure he's ready to ready to go home. So they would send an officer and his pay up the rail, up the reading line, would come up here to the headquarters. Private uh, Jones would be summoned to the headquarters and be given his just discharge paper, be given his final pay, be given a pass uh, to go home on the railroad. The state was providing passes for the men. He would head off to Pottstown or Reading or Scranton or Lancaster or the farm, wherever he was from. Two thirds of the men who came here were from Philadelphia regiments, so they would head right back into the city. So that that's a rough idea of what Camp Discharge was for. It served about 1,100 men, again from 89 regiments, which would have been about 89,000 men. But these were the the stragglers who had made their way up here. So Camp Discharge was set up for that special purpose, and again, it had these hospitals sure were very busy taking care of the men. Some were admitted to the hospitals uh, for round-the-clock care. Others were outpatients. They would go in, get their medicine or whatever treatment, and then go back to the barracks. It was not a place where the men wanted to be, as you can imagine. They were happy to be alive, um, but they wanted out. Um, and so they were trickling out in that process. Um, it was what kept the hopes up of the others to see some of their men being, you know, their comrades heading home. And then finally, when the war ended, was winding down, there was just ma mass release from here. And the men were uh, heading off as the army demobilized as quickly as it could. Camp discharge was then um, mothballed for a while. They kept a few of the hospitals open for the most sick men through the summer of 65. But then the end of 65, they had an auction and everything in the camp was broken up and sold off. All the boards and the nails and the windows and the doors um, went hither and yon. There was a big, magnificent flagpole that was here, uh, a landmark you could see apparently from miles around. That was sold off as well. Um, ended up at the mill up in Conshohocken for a while. Um, and Camp Discharge kind of faded into history. The, the Allen Wood family named their estate, uh, which was across, it wasn't right on the premises here, it was over there, um, Camp Discharge in honor of the camp. And some people have been confused. They think Camp Discharge was over there because of that reason, or didn't know what Camp Discharge even was. But it, it was the Civil War camp, and you're standing right now in the premises of it and um, so we really have Brad to thank for bringing this back because of the hard work that he did of both digging and um, getting the historical society uh, interested in again in it again Jerry Francis the late uh, president of the historical society uh, was very interested in this story reached out and knew that I had written some books and asked me to come and partner with Brad and turn this into a full book, and it was a wonderful, you know, rewarding experience for me. And uh, I really want to thank Brad 